you listened to the daily cancellation on Friday, then you already knew that this daily cancellation was coming. On Friday, we discussed the um, idea of reparations, in particular, the plan proposed in California that would dole out $5 million apiece to black residents as repayment for the enslavement that they never experienced and that nobody they've ever known or spoken to has, has experienced. During that segment, I expanded on a counterpoint, a counterpoint to reparations that had been made by a black college professor named Wilford Riley, which was a restatement of an argument made by others through the years, including Dinesh D'Souza, which uh, says that reparation proposals are incoherent because they rest on the speculative notion that descendants of slaves are in a worse place today than they otherwise would have been if their ancestors were never enslaved. Now, if this speculation is not accurate, if they are not in a worse spot, then there's nothing to repair. Nothing to repair for them anyway. Certainly we know that the slaves suffered greatly, but the slaves are all dead. So the reparations don't go to them, but rather go to people who, again, never experienced slavery. And so we must ask what exactly we are repairing as far as they are concerned. According to this argument, which I find compelling and interesting, the more plausible speculation is that, in fact, the ancestors of slaves are in a better spot today, not worse, because of slavery. This doesn't justify slavery or make it okay, obviously. It simply calls into question the basic logic behind allowing a group to literally cash in on historical atrocities. That's the point. And in, in an incredibly surprising turn of events, people aren't happy with this point. And this came as a great shock to me personally, as I'm a people pleaser who always tries to avoid controversy and conflict whenever I can. Uh, but it found me this time, maybe for the first time, starting as always, as always with the requisite Media Matters clip. Our PR reps pulled a two-minute slice of the 10-minute monologue, did not provide any context, um, didn't even clarify that this was a conversation about reparations specifically, and they posted a clip which then went viral. Now, for reference, uh, we'll, we'll play the actual video they posted uh, so that you understand where, where we are, what we're talking about for the rest of the conversation, which again is just one small sliver of a much longer monologue where I flesh out all these points and also explain why I'm making the points and what the overall point is. But Media Matters never bothers with silly things like context, and they also know that the drooling hordes who get worked up by out-of-context clips also aren't going to stop to wonder about the context. So with that in mind, um, here's what they posted. In fact, it seems rather clear that black Americans are doing better here today than they would be had their ancestors generations ago never been brought to these shores. We can prove this point by simply asking which African country anyone asking for reparations would prefer to live in. The answer, of course, is none of them. Now, you might offer the rebuttal that if slavery never existed, if we're reimagining history without that institution at all, then uh, Africa itself would be in a better shape, better place and better shape. And maybe indeed black Americans would be better off there. But this seems highly unlikely, and it also ignores the fact that Africans participated in slavery and the slave trade as much as they were victims of it. Not to mention, if we're reimagining the world without African slavery, then we have to also imagine it without all other forms of global slavery, since African slavery was merely one variety, one offshoot of this global institution. And now we have totally, in that point, rewritten the history of the world in a way so dramatic that it, it's absolutely impossible to say which individuals today would end up worse or better in this alternate universe. I mean, if you go back in time and get rid of slavery from the entire world, you have just, it's impossible to say what the world looks like right now. Actually, what we can say is that we'd all end up worse, all of us today would be in a worse spot if uh, slavery never existed at all across the entire globe. Because a change that significant would likely shift the course of events in a way that would mean none of us would even exist. It would be a world full of other people who are not us. So I know that I benefit today from virtually everything my ancestors did and everything did to them, because if any of that had not happened, there's a very good chance that I never would have come into being. And as I see it, I benefit from being if the other option is not being. Well, you can already uh, imagine the reaction, so we don't need to read through very many of these. But uh, here are a few people of the thousands who expressed their outrage at a point that it goes without saying. None of them even attempted to refute. Heath Mayo, a man who calls himself a Christian conservative and who also happens to look exactly like his name for the record, tweeted, This is Ben Shapiro's Daily Wire, and increasingly you're just a bad person if you support this know-nothing filth with your subscription dollars. Bernice King, the daughter of uh, Martin Luther King Jr., responded, and here it is, one of the reasons why some don't want the horrors of slavery taught in schools, because they don't see it, or Jim Crow, 
as an atrocity, but a grotesque statement, an egregious insult to the countless Africans who perished in the Atlantic or were enslaved here. Of course, race hustling shill Roland Martin got his two cents in. This analysis by Matt Walsh is the dumbest you'll ever see. This idiot wants to opine about the condition of Africa, yet makes no mention of racist white colonialism. Hell, racist whites redrew the boundaries of Africa at the 1885 Berlin Conference. What a Wajahat Ali kept it simple. Pro-slavery, eh? Hell of a plot twist. A guy named Ryan McMakin posted, Walsh has been good on exposing the dumbness of the whole men can be women thing, but there are not words sufficient to describe how stupid this statement about slavery is. The argument is the sort of arcane, trivial mental masturbation I would expect from a college freshman philosophy major. And given that his apparent point here is to basically say, stop saying slavery was so bad, it's a totally bizarre hill to die on. And there was also a lot of stuff like this. When Matt Walsh eventually dies a hopefully incredibly horrific, painful death, it'll be very cool watching people celebrate. Now, I actually agree uh, with that last one. Um, not the bit about hoping I die painfully. I, you know, I prefer not to die painfully, but the second part, um, I know that many people will celebrate my death, and I take great pride in that. If I, if I spent my life fighting against the left's cultural agenda, and then I died, and they didn't cheer over my death and mock me as I lay buried in the ground, that would be a strong indication that I was incredibly ineffective. The left will, will celebrate your death if they perceive you as a serious threat, and I certainly wish to be a serious threat. But that aside... Um, let me offer a few thoughts in response to uh, the responses. Two thoughts, to be precise. First, predictably, everybody in the outrage mob accuses me of arguing that slavery wasn't bad or that it wasn't an atrocity or that it, that it was actually good. I didn't say any of those things, nor did I imply or suggest them. In fact, I refer to slavery as an atrocity in the very segment where Bernice King says I argue that it wasn't an atrocity. Obviously, I believe it was an atrocity. Everyone believes that. It's a point so self-evident and clear that it doesn't even need to be said. Okay, it's actually, it's, it's a, it is a pointless thing to even say because everyone knows it. There is not a pro-slavery faction in the modern United States. So there's no need to continually assure each other that slavery was bad. Hey, you know, you know slavery was bad? Yeah, it was bad. It's really bad. Very, very bad. It's all bad. It's really bad. We know that. It's one of the few things that we all still know. So when the pitchfork mob accuses me of holding the view that slavery wasn't bad, what they mean is that all I'm allowed to say about slavery is that it was bad. Okay? They want us to talk about slavery. They definitely want us to talk about it. They want us to harp on it. They want us to go on and on about it, just like they do. But the only thing we're ever allowed to say is some variation of it was bad over and over and over again. Um, if you try to move on to the next sentence, it was bad, end of sentence, and then continue and say something else about it. If you try to articulate some other thought, if you try to say anything else about it, you are automatically guilty of thinking that it's not bad. Um, in other words, if it was bad isn't your only thought about slavery, then you don't have that thought about it at all. So either you... Either the only thing you think about slavery is that it was bad, or you think it was good. You're not allowed to have, you know, you're only allowed to have one thought per topic. And this is how they treat slavery. It's how they treat every other subject. They have, for every, every subject, here's the thought you can have on that. And uh, if you're going to talk about it, yeah, go ahead and talk about it. But only just say that. Continue saying that over and over and over again. And this is what makes debate and dialogue on the national level totally impossible, not to mention incredibly boring, when we're all just repeating back to each other the stuff we already know and has long been established. How can we have a dialogue when you aren't allowed to develop your thoughts beyond, this was bad, very bad, it was so bad, it was so, so bad, it was the bad thing, it was a really bad thing. You know, it wasn't always this day, as I meant, as this way, as I mentioned, Dinesh D'Souza has been making a similar argument for years. In fact, here, here he is on NPR, NPR of all places, because this is the kind of thing you, that you used to be able to say on NPR 22 years ago. Um, listen to what he says. As a native of India, a country colonized by the British for centuries, and as a person of color living in the United States, I cannot agree with the idea of reparations. 
the concept of reparations is based on the premise that the descendants of slavery and colonialism are worse off as a result of those historical crimes. In reality, these descendants are vastly better off than they would have been had slavery and colonialism never occurred. Let me explain. When I was a young boy growing up in Bombay, I noticed that my grandfather, who had grown up under British colonialism, had developed a strong hostility to the white man. I realized that he had an anti-white animus that I didn't share. This puzzled me. Why did he and I feel so differently? Finally, I figured it out. The reason for our difference of perception was that colonialism had been pretty bad for him and pretty good for me. Another way to put it is that colonialism had injured those who lived under it, but paradoxically it proved beneficial to their descendants. Virtually everything that I do and cherish has been shaped by a worldview that was brought to India by colonialism. I write in English. I work on a computer. I believe in individual dignity, in human rights, in democratic government, in equality before the law, in the concept of innocent until proven guilty. All these things are the product of Western civilization. Now, again, NPR, you could say that, 22 years ago. Now, it's the sort of thing that you'll only ever hear uttered on conservative media, and even there, most of the time, not. And if you do hear it, it's shocking. It's utterly shocking. Now, leftists, of course, disagreed, I would imagine, many of them did, um, with that at the time. But there wasn't any nuclear explosion of mindless outrage with a bunch of slobbering dummies screaming, you support slavery, you think slavery is good. People understood the point that he was making because it is at a minimum valid and logical and thoughtful. It also happens to be self-evidently true. But these days, thanks to social media, thanks to the increasing derangement of the left, thanks to plummeting IQ stores, scores and all the rest of it, um, you cannot make valid and logical arguments because a valid and logical argument requires you to develop a thought beyond the one simple, shallow slogan that the left demands we all consign ourselves to. Second, you can somewhat understand the left's confusion here, I suppose. They firmly believe that the ends justify the means. Okay? It's one of the core beliefs of their ideology, the ends justify the means. So um, when they hear this discussion, they assume that I'm making an ends justify the means argument. Because if they were making the argument, that's what they would be doing. If I'm saying that people today have benefited from historical atrocities, I must be saying that the atrocities were actually good and justified because that's how they think. But that's not how I think. Okay, I think that there are no results that could ever retroactively justify an evil act. Let me give you an example. If I were to shoot you and send you to the hospital, and, and you don't die. And while you're at the hospital, they, you know, because they're doing all these tests and everything, they happen to discover, incidentally, that you have an aggressive form of cancer. And so they treat the cancer and you survive. My attempted murder does not retroactively become a form of medical treatment. Okay, it does not become good. Now, it's true that if I hadn't shot you, you never would have discovered your cancer, perhaps. And then, or maybe you would have discovered it too late. So, Paradoxically, me shooting you resulted in saving your life. But it was still an act of objective evil to shoot you. Okay? So that's the way that works. Now, here's the thing. If, expanding the analogy, if after having your cancer treated, you go on to have children, and then your children have children, and your children's children have children, and many years down the line, your descendants try to sue my descendants for the generational trauma caused by my assault against you. Well, if that were to happen, then in that case, it would suddenly become relevant to point out that these people claiming damages decades and decades removed from the incident probably wouldn't exist. Their entire family tree would be erased if not for the evil act that they are now trying to cash in on. That's the crux of it. Okay, the point that you have most likely benefited from historical evils becomes relevant when you attempt to quantify and monetize the trickle-down harm that you claim the historical evil has done to you. It's at that juncture that someone needs to make the obvious point. This thing that happened long ago was very, very bad. 
It was very bad for your ancestors. It is not, however, very bad for you. Yet you are the one claiming quantifiable and financial harm. The reparations demands are what makes this point especially relevant, but, but even without reparations, there's still value in acknowledging what we're talking about here and, and thinking about it. Yes, it is true that you likely would not be here today if history had not unfolded exactly as it did, right? The butterfly effect. The good, the bad, the ugly, the atrocious, all of it led to you and to me. Rewrite history and you will have written us out of the book completely. Aside from disqualifying any reparations demand, which I think it does completely, what else does that mean for you? Well, it simply means that we shouldn't live our lives obsessed with wrongs committed long ago, consumed by resentment over ancient sins. It doesn't mean those sins were not sins, okay? It doesn't mean that the wrongs were actually right. It just means that we should stop trying to make ourselves the victims of the very events that resulted in our existence, our existence in the most prosperous and comfortable civilization in history, I might add. We should, in a word, move on with our lives the lives that we are blessed to be living. Because what else is there to do but just keep living in the moment, in today? That's the point. And that's also why the outrage mob is today, once again, canceled. And that'll do it for this portion of the show. As we move over to members block. Hope to see you there. If not, talk to you on uh, tomorrow. Godspeed.